uh, uh, our C4 yield, uh, we are also coming out with an, a very unique, uh, 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 you know, hard work uh, representing the community contributions uh, that will also beneficial, you know, society to embrace the environment in a right way. Uh, so these are some of the activities. Of course, uh, uh, we also do, uh, but uh, we need significant uh, effort also to uh, go for uh, good publications. So that's also a part of that. I go to the next. So coming to this, uh, uh, you know, uh, actually this is uh, uh, initiatives with a lot of collaboration networking also helped us uh, in organizing an international conference. I, I take this opportunity to, you know, invite you to uh, a part of this and uh, visit uh, India during December. Uh, it is a night's nice time. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this conference will going to happen in uh, uh, Bangalore this time. And uh, so today I'm just already made a request to him. So others also, I, I'm extending my uh, warm invitation. So this conference will going to happen uh, uh, in uh, uh, IIC Bangalore. Again, it's uh, one of the leading research institute in the country. Uh, so this will happen from 4th to 8th uh, December. Uh, so uh, till paper submission is happens uh, uh, 15th of uh, September. If you have any research students who may be interested, please encourage them to uh, submit it. Uh, this will be uh, organized uh, jointly with uh, several uh, leading institutes across the globe. Next. So coming to air quality management lecture series, I, I told you this is a first of its kind in India and, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 we are, this is the 35th, 35th month lecture, uh, basically to uh, make sure that, uh, that we wanted to uh, encourage the young researchers, scientists, engineers, and also the educators and industries to, you know, uh, ex ex explore the opportunities in the air quality management uh, research, and uh, see, understand what is the latest advancement, uh, understand experiences through case studies, and uh, any technologies being developed, how it will be beneficial for air quality management, and also brings a lot of networking uh, through these activities. Next. So these are all our uh, past uh, lectures, and you can see that Sator is also uh, one of the uh, you know expert speaker who, have, who has kindly supported us earlier. Next, yeah, these are all. Uh, so you can you can see that uh, we have we have uh, uh, speakers across the globe with uh, various expertise. Uh, they have uh, shared their uh, experience in the past. Next. So now it is. We are very pleased and very happy, honored to uh, you, you agree to give today's talk in the air quality management lecture series. Uh, I, I welcome you and I welcome all the participants. And uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very sorry for the delay again. Uh, I welcome you all uh, to the this uh, lecture series and particularly Satoris is also here. And uh, good morning, Satoris, and yeah, maybe it's a good afternoon to you. Uh, so uh, I request uh, Gopika to introduce the speaker and also the, briefly about the abstract. Very good morning and afternoon to everyone present. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for the day, Dr. Simon Haberle. He is the director of the School of Culture, Culture, History and Language and professor of Paleoecology and Natural History, College of Asia and the Pacific at the Australian National University. Completed his PhD at ANU on the late quaternary environmental history of the Tari Basin, Papua New Guinea in 1994. While holding postdoctoral positions at the Smithsonian and at the University of Cambridge, he continued to pursue his interest in the role of past climate change in human activity on tropical and temperate ecosystems through the work in Amazon Basin and Southern South America. His research is currently focused on the application of high resolution paleoecological analysis to our understanding of the impact of climate variability and human activity on terrestrial ecosystems of the Pacific and Indian Oceans during the Holocene. He is also developing e-research tools in paleoecology, such as the Aust uh, Australasian Pollen and Spore Atlas and the PaleoWorks website. He is currently using his knowledge of Australian pollen to explore the impact of atmospheric pollen and spores on respiratory health. Talk for today is titled The Abundance, Allergic Effects, and Public Health Burden of Airborne Pollen in Australia. 
which will be focused on the city of Canberra, which is one of the cave fever hotspots in Australia, and explore why this region has such a high prevalence of allergic rhinitis. It also highlights the need for long-term aerobiological monitoring in Australian urban areas in a systemic, standardized and sustained way and provide a framework for targeting the most clinically significant taxa in terms of abundance, allerg allergenic effects and public health burden. Sir, we welcome you once again. Please share your screen for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. I have to unshare. Yeah, that's right. Can everybody see that and hear me? Yes, uh, yes, Simon. We can. We can see that. Great. <laughs> well, thanks so much for the very kind welcome and an invitation to this um, wonderful lecture series. So I can see it's been a very enriching and. Um, uh, must have been very enlightening to see all the different talks from around the world. So I'm very privileged and honoured to be able to today uh, present some information from the Australian region. And uh, hopefully through this lecture, you'll be, get a sense of just how um, <clears throat> well, how uh, perhaps early we are in the stage of understanding uh, airborne pollen and uh, the impact of uh, allergic pollen uh, on, on people in our region and also get a sense of how quite exciting I think the research is moving forward and the opportunities we have to uh, you know, explore new ways of understanding and, and helping people reduce the impact of hay fever and asthma, allergic rhinitis on, on their daily lives. And as you can see, the, um, my background is not purely in uh, uh, airborne pollen or um, uh, the study of, of uh, allergenic pollen. Uh, my, hist my background is very much uh, in geography and uh, looking at the long-term history of people in the landscape. And so I work closely with archaeologists and geographers and a whole range of people in uh, understanding how our landscapes and our uh, histories have changed over time and the impact of climate, of course, as well over not just tens of years, but hundreds and thousands of years. So um, I bring to this, I guess, a quite diverse background and one that I hope will, um, we can uh, kind of and, yeah, provides a, a different perspective on, on, the, on this issue of how pollen impacts us uh, in, our, in our daily lives. So really, yeah, to begin with, I'll, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the basics of airborne pollen and um, how it uh, you know, can, can impact people in terms of hay fever and, and asthma. Um, one of the most significant sources, uh, and I think this is probably around the world, but uh, grass pollen is, is particularly um, uh, important in terms of uh, airborne allergenic uh, particles that affect people. And there's definitely a, a causal link between grass pollen allergens and allergenic rhinitis. Um, and this has been proven, as I mentioned, around the world. But it's not just grass pollen, but many other different pollen types as well. Um, in Australia, of course, uh, we have a very different flora and fauna, um, as, you, as you know. Uh, but of course, over the last 200 years of colonization, um, there has been, again, many, many uh, introduced plants from, uh, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, brought to Australia and have become quite widespread. And many of these, of course, are the, are the plants that produce abundant pollen that is of, uh, have allergenic properties. Uh, in Australia itself, the Australian plants, and I'm sure you're familiar with um, eucalyptus gum trees and, and casuarina and these kind of uh, perhaps familiar plants in the northern hemisphere. Um, they are less, much less is known about their allergenic qualities. Um, and this is part of what we're doing here in our research is to try and understand not just the impact of introduced plants and the weeds that we are very common um, in Australia, but also 
the uh, role of native plants as well. But right at the moment, it's um, <clears throat> not quite spring here. Uh, soon it will be, excuse me. It will be spring soon, but just during this late winter period, we have a number of plants such as the cypress pines that are producing abundant amounts of pollen and causing uh, you know, a number of people a lot of uh, you know, trouble in terms of their hay fever and, and asthma um, symptoms. A number of other trees are very commonly planted, not just in people's gardens, but around the streetscapes. Urban streetscapes are, uh, have these uh, many uh, trees, such as the plane tree, um, very common across the Northern Hemisphere as well. But these are well known as, um, as allergenic trees and pollen plays a role in that. Uh, another common plant in the gardens, you know, hedge, rose, the privet, um, and this is again uh, a good example of the kind of not just tall trees but shrubs that can um, cause allergies. And of course we go down to our um, shrubs and then herbs as well. Plantago, very common weed in Australia. Even though we do have a native Plantago, the, the introduced Plantago here has become much more widespread in the pastures and, and agricultural lands that uh, uh, surround many of our um, major cities. So, as you may know, there's quite a complex um, uh, sequence of uh, trajectories, I guess, or vectors that um, enable the pollen from a plant, a flowering plant, to be brought into the atmosphere and then end up in our nasal passages in our airways and cause uh, health problems. And this is kind of a summary of those that trajectory from the biodiversity, um, biogeographic uh, location of where these plants are and you see a map of Australia there right from the tropics in the north down to the temperate regions in the south um, and of course different grasses different plants occur across that region and and wherever you go or live in Australia you will be exposed to quite different um, suite of plant uh, species um, so it's the first thing we need to learn about um, and then of course the timing of, of flowering is very important and that can be impacted if a plant is introduced from overseas it obviously creates a um, perhaps a different response in that plant in terms of its flowering time um, and so we need to learn more about that um, and the, the diversity of how plant uh, those pollen types get um, entrained into the atmosphere and their dispersal through wind in primarily um, those kind of microclimatic uh, information and then of course um, in a urban setting, how that uh, those pollens get distributed across uh, a cityscape where most of the people are being affected by um, by the distributed pollen. And there, as you can imagine, and this is a nice picture of a cypress, um, cupress acy tree uh, shedding its pollen. And, and we are even seeing this today in Canberra, this is happening. A uh, number of trees you know, in the regions are uh, uh, producing this kind of abundant pollen. So people see that and, and um, its impacts clearly can impact their, their health and well-being um, with abundance of pollen being produced. So at the same time, there are the spring approaches. There are many other beautiful plants being um, uh, produced, uh, flowering as well. And of course, many of these are insect pollinated, not part of the the uh, sort of equation of, of what causes allergic responses in people. Um, we focus on the wind pollinated plants only, and these are the key um, to understanding uh, you know, the, the cycles of hay fever and uh, asthma responses to airborne pollen. And as I mentioned, uh, Canberra is, is, as you may know, is a mid-sized city in Australia. Of course, Sydney and Melbourne, the better known cities, have many millions of people living in them. In Canberra, we have around half a million people. Uh, and yet it is uh, a real hotspot for hay fever and asthma. It's a place where the most people suffer in terms of per capita, um, in terms of uh, hay fever and asthma responses. Um, and it's a beautiful landscape. Those who have had the privilege to, to visit, and I know Professor Shiva was visiting here fairly recently and uh, experienced the Canberra landscape. And you could see here that it um, has a mixture of 
very colourful, mostly introduced trees and, and plant species in the gardens and, and parklands. And, but in amongst that are the native trees. In the background there, you'll see the eucalyptus trees um, are also interwoven in the landscape. Um, so it's a, a, a really mixed sort of uh, landscape to, to be living in, in terms of its plant uh, diversity. And we did a little exercise here based on a, a wonderful resource. We have the um, Atlas of Living Australia, which provides a lot of data on where different plants have been recorded in our landscape. And by simply adding together some of the 30 odd uh, key allergenic plants and looking at their distribution across Australia, the data here, as you can imagine, is, is a little bit patchy, but um, you can start to see some of the red boxes essentially correlate to um, some of the major cities. And those, when it's red, it means the species richness index is very high, or the species richness of allergenic plant species is really high in some of these cities. And that's, when you think about it, um, quite logical. People plant these trees and shrubs in their gardens, and most people live within cities. And so you'll get a high diversity of potentially allergenic plants being planted in an urban landscape. But what really stands out here, you can see the top city for the most diverse allergenic plants is actually Canberra, second to Melbourne, Adelaide, and some of the other smaller cities. Um, so Canberra itself is a really high uh, and diverse plant um, environment. And so when you bring that together, we um, we're actually only fairly recently, only in the last 10 years, have we started to ask those questions of why is Canberra or why are many of the cities um, quite high uh, impacted by, by hay fever? Um, and we started a program of monitoring uh, the pollen uh, using the Burkhardt system, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's on the top of a, uh, one of the buildings here at the Australian National University. And we operate this Burkhardt counter, um, which collects the pollen every day onto a microscopic slide. And we take that slide and count it and provide that data uh, on an online system, which I'll explain a little bit more about in a minute. But um, essentially, yeah, the notion and the and the understanding that Canberra was really um, one of the the worst places in Australia for hay fever uh, prompted this study to um, to be done, and we were able to get some funding to help um, establish this program, the Canberra Pollen Monitoring Program. And I'll give you a sense of what that's revealed, I guess, over the last few years, um, and hopefully into the future as well. Uh, grass is certainly a, one of the key pollen types that um, impact people here in Canberra. And we know this both anecdotally or from clinical um, information, but also from the, the work that we're doing as well. And I'll show you some of those results. But clearly it's during that sort of uh, around October, um, beginning of October, late September, the grass pollen begins to rise. And you can see the grass pollen grains per meter cubed that we record. Um, this is a summation of around seven years of data. Uh, but uh, the blue line is essentially that average um, uh, over the over the grass pollen season. We have a peak in uh, late October through into November. We see the peak pollen season for grasses, and then it declines, but then has a slight resurgence in in the early um, to mid summer period as well. So it's quite an extended grass season, and it's one that's been quite variable in our in our yearly uh, measures over time. And here's a sense of what that looks like across the Australian landscape in Brisbane, further in the north, subtropical, Sydney, and then Canberra in the middle there, Melbourne in the south, and Hobart in the in the deep part of uh, south southern part. Um, and you can see there's a um, slightly different character to the grass pollen seasons across Australia. This is a latitudinal transect from north to south, um, and you can see Canberra sits reasonably in the middle, and the and the Kind of patterns are, are not dissimilar, um, you know, across uh, north and south, um, even though uh, the seasons in the north are quite shifted quite a little bit because of um, the wet and dry season differences in the climate. Um, but yeah, we're obviously thinking quite a lot about what the impact of climate change will be on 
these kind of season seasonal averages we're beginning to record. Um, and of course, climate is changing as we speak, so it's a, a moving baseline in many ways, and we need to be able to um, continue to monitor the beginning and the extent and the intensity of these seasons uh, to begin to understand how uh, ongoing climate change will impact the the length and the in, and the strength of um, the grass season and other pollen seasons throughout the year. And here's another sort of insight into the into that transect, if you like, and you see Brisbane um, on the east coast there, and get down through to Hobart, and um, those dots represent grasses, allergenic grasses that are of subtropical origin, like the Bermuda grass, and down in the south, the blue dots represent temperate species, um, like ryegrass. Uh, and you can see there's uh, a biogeographic shift as you move from the south into the north. And again, Canberra sits in this, and Sydney sit in this sort of middle zone where you get both um, tropical species and, or subtropical species and temperate grass species overlapping. Um, and you can imagine if we see a time when temperatures begin to increase, glo global warming um, becomes more intense, some of the distributions of these species will actually shift and potentially the subtropical species will become, become more abundant in a place like Canberra. Um, and this is something that uh, is really important to begin to understand and to begin to perhaps model and predict uh, what will be happening and how quickly into the future. And again, we are focusing again uh, on that kind of climate change variability and how climate states, different climate states can impact pollen <coughs> abundance and, and seasonal length. And here's an example uh, in, of a climate system which is very important in Australia, the Southern uh, Oscillation Index or El Nino and La Nino conditions. When we have a El Nino, that's when we have quite dry conditions, drought often in Eastern Australia. When we have a La Nina, which we're still in just at the moment, it's quite wet. Um, and when it's wet, we have floods, but also the grasslands can become quite abundant and productive as well. And so you can see that manifesting here. You can see um, during very low cumulative pollen count periods from October to December, these graphs represent different years. In the last couple of years, which 2020, 21 and 2022, that's been uh, La Nina, very wet. And you'll see there's quite extreme and high counts of pollen. Um, during other years, which are uh, El Nino, the pollen is very much lower <coughs> or on a sort of an average level. Um, and this is, again, uh, patterns we're beginning to see in our data. And just to remind you that our data isn't very long in terms of the number of years we've been collecting it. It's only 10, 10 or so years, but um, uh, it's certainly beginning to reveal some quite interesting patterns. And this will help us understand how to better predict what will each season may, may bring us. And here's this last pollen season, grass pollen season. You can see the red represents extreme days in this graph. Um, and these are days when very high counts and potentially quite dangerous for people, particularly with asthma and um, you know, uh, having severe allergenic responses to to the grass pollen. And there were a very high number of those over the over that period from October to January um, in this last year, uh, the most extreme we've seen in our in our records. And that related to this period of very uh, wet and high grass productivity uh, conditions. But it's not just the grasses. This is another uh, graph related to um, other uh, plant type types. And here we, even into February and even into the autumn months of March, we do see some uh, periods of uh, intense uh, pollen production, not in grasses, but in things like elm trees, the Chinese elm in particular, and she oak, which is our casuarina. Uh, that's actually the one native tree in Australia that is known to produce allergenic um, effects, uh, hay fever and asthma. Uh, that has a flowering season then as well. So 
when you start to put all these different uh, trees and shrubs and grasses together in terms of uh, seasonal impacts, um, the actual time when people in a place like Canberra uh, are affected one way or another by pollen is begins to be, be quite long. And again, this relates back to that notion that Canberra is a real hotspot or a uh, place where a lot of people suffer from hay fever. About the quality of the image there, but it gives you a sense of uh, from June through to May. Um, on the top there, you'll see this is a, like a calendar of different uh, taxa pollen types that we've been recording and plotting up when they have their peak season. So the blue is the peak of pollen production, the grey bar is the seasonal length of pollen production, but you can see quite a number. It's not just two or three species. There's um, um, around 20 odd species there that uh, are well known and, and reasonably well documented, documented now um, in the in the landscape. And as you can see, there's a very long sort of pollen season, if you like, for for Canberra. In many ways, you could say it lasts from July when we have some of the trees, such as the cypress pine flowering. Um, through into early March when we have the you know, the she oaks and um, elms and so on doing their final flowering period. So, so quite quite an interesting uh, compilation and one that I believe isn't um, you know, isn't necessarily set in stone. And as I mentioned, we're currently in a phase of climate change, I think, and. Uh, the data we're gathering now is really this moving baseline of of information, and we need to be cognizant of uh, the fact that uh, many of the environmental factors are changing quite rapidly, and will be impacting on the seasonal length and intensity of flowering of many of these species. And this just gives you that that's a common diagram many would have seen um, showing the the kind of impact of climate change on human health in many different factors, but uh, sort of air pollution is one of those uh, uh, wedges there that are being highlighted, but also you know, increase in increasing allergens um, and the impact of climate change on uh, the production of allergenic pollen um, is, is a, a definitely a very significant factor. So the key issues for Australian aerobiology um, and giving you a bit of a summary of what the region sort of looks like, I guess, it's um, certainly the prevalence of respiratory disease is amongst the highest in the world is one of the factors we're, we're learning. Um, and some of the forms of allergenic respiratory disease, um, allergenic rhinitis, asthma, uh, uh, and it's very pervasive and frequent. And across Australia, it's roughly around 20% of the Australian population on average. So one in five people um, are known to be affected by um, allergic rhinitis. And some of the surveys that have been brought to bear on this suggest that you know, it's estimated very high cost. Um, one estimate is you know, around $8 billion a year, but you know, I'm sure you could um, look at that in many ways. <laughs> but it signifies a, a very significant um, impact, uh, both on public health, but on you know, yeah, on an economic level as well. And these rates appear to be rising, and it's quite significant and a challenge for public uh, for public health institutions to try and work out ways of reducing that. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit more in the next part of the talk. And that question should be would be concerned, certainly. So this is just one snapshot um, over a decade ago of the prevalence of allergic uh, respiratory disease in Australia. It looks to be amongst one of the highest in the world. The red countries there seem to be recording some of this. Um, and I'm sure there's new data that could be brought to bear to this, but it does sort of highlight that um, places like Australia and places like Brazil as well, as well where you've got lots of pasture Big cattle ranches, um, those kind of things where introduced grass species are very prevalent, um, certainly uh, may be one of the causes for uh, high grass related allergies in particular. Another survey that I'll just show you this um, summary of uh, 
This is something done in our national institutions uh, here, a survey in 2007 to look at the percentage of people with allergic rhinitis in each of the states. So ACT is Australian Capital Territory, which is where Canberra is, um, Western Australia, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania, New South Wales, Queensland, and a, and a total of for Australia on the right hand column there. But you can see back in 2007, that survey showed again around 15% of people um, in Australia suffering from allergic rhinitis. In Canberra, it was around one in five people, 20%. Um, but the retaking of that survey in 2017, 10 years later, showed a much increased incidents, particularly in Canberra and some of the other states such as Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia. Um, but in, a, in Canberra, it was almost one in three people um, suffering from allergic rhinitis. So there's been an increase over those 10 years. Now, whether that's a function of the survey, function of a real increase, um, you know, that's, that's certainly a criticism that could be brought to bear, but I think you know it's the same survey taken twice, and is that trend real? And if it is, then it's definitely something that we should be concerned about um, and understand better what's going on in our region. One way to do that is to look at the kind of land cover, land cover, and climate aspects of the region. This is um, something I'm particularly interested in. Here, there's uh, kind of vegetation maps, if you like. Um, summarised there in the B column. And for Canberra, you can see Canberra is surrounded by dark green, which is some of the forests, woodlands, and light green is more of uh, open uh, uh, kind of grasslands and pastures. Um, but what stands out in these three comparisons, Brisbane, Sydney, Canberra, Melbourne, is that uh, Canberra is the only city really that is landlocked. It's not surrounded by or has some ocean nearby it. Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, all the cities on that have on the ocean. And so there's a much higher potential for sea breezes or wind coming from that ocean, which is not bearing any pollen uh, to be blown over the city. So um, in Canberra, whichever direction the wind is blowing, you will be bringing pollen into that cityscape. Um, so I guess the message there is again, one of the reasons why we're seeing such High incidence in a place like Canberra is uh, its 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 geographical situation as well. Another fascinating phenomenon and quite uh, devastating in many ways that's been uh, well recorded in, particularly in Melbourne, but has been noted in places like Canberra and Sydney and Brisbane, is this phenomenon of the thunderstorm asthma events. And there was a major event back in 2016, in fact, in Melbourne, where around 10 people died, but some 8,000 people were impacted in a very severe way by a sudden thunderstorm, which front coming over the city, which um, coincided with a very extreme grass pollen day. And this resulted in these grass pollens being entrained into the thunderstorm front, um, perhaps being uh, one thought is there's a higher uh, electric charge being imparted on the pollen itself or potentially higher moisture change uh, uh, resulting in the internal contents of the grass pollen, which also contain the allergenic proteins, um, being evolved and also put into the atmosphere. So it's not just a grass pollen floating in the atmosphere and potentially going into your nose. Um, it's uh, these very, very fine particles that have come out of the grass pollen grain being enabling that to be inhaled. And of course, that gets deeper into your lungs and produced very severe responses. And as I mentioned, so over 10 people died, but within three hours, 8,000 people were calling ambulances and trying to get help um, in, in that uh, one particular incident in Melbourne in, two, in November of 2016. And so there was a lot of activity in looking at has this occurred before, um, which other cities is this potentially going to occur in? And we did a little bit of work in Canberra where we were monitoring people, the numbers of people going into hospitals and with asthma 
um, for emergency care uh, compared to the daily grass pollen counts. And this is just one example of that, um, where you see the, the blue is the grass pollen counts over a, one particular season, um, and the red is the number of admissions into one of the hospitals here. Um, quite low numbers, but certainly during one particular event where there were thunderstorms in the region, very high grass pollen counts, and uh, this coincided with the record asthma presentations at the Canberra Hospital Emergency Department. So potentially there was um, a, a minor thunderstorm atmos th thunder thunderstorm asthma event that was occurring uh, over that one or two days as well. Um, of course, you do have very high grass pollen counts on other days, but not necessarily people being admitted to the emergency department. Um, but there were no thunderstorms occurring on those days. So, so this link between thunderstorms, high grass pollen, and emergency um, events happening related to allergic rhinitis um, is certainly something that's um, becoming uh, certainly much better known and better recorded and potentially, uh, again, could be more frequent um, given the nature of climate change in this region. So the big challenge is what do we do? Now we know we're beginning to know all this information, beginning to have a good map of how different places um, have different types of pollen. We know the climate system um, and we know that people are definitely suffering at different levels in different cities. So one of the real challenges is to get this real-time environmental and health data available, um, some sort of public ma health management system and individual health management system as well. So we've been concentrating on the potential of uh, bringing this information to the public through uh, our citizen science projects, but also through um, the, the phone apps, which I'll explain in a minute, this uh, information that people can get on their phone um, in a very rapid way. Uh, and this, again, just I guess summarizes some of those big threats to climate change. Increased CO2 is certainly known to generate greater allergenicity in some of the grass pollens in particular. So that's one of those trends or changes we need to monitor. Change of changing seasonal length, longer and stronger they appear to be in some years. Um, the kind of urban development that's going on, what kind of trees are being planted, um, how can we, we can influence that, and knowledge of this environmental human health interactions. And it's this last one that we're bringing to bear some of the citizen science and new AI kind of um, capacity. Uh, so there's different ways of approaching this. Um, one, one option is there, which might work, uh, but option two is really, I think, to, to build a national pollen monitoring network to help people manage and their hay fever and asthma. And that's what we've been doing over the last four or five years. We've pulled together a, a national aero biology network here in Australia um, in a number of the cap capital cities where we have people doing essentially what I'm describing today um, in their own cities and bringing that information together in a unified and uh, common protocols being used to gather the data um, and to deliver this in an easy free information system. And this is the phone apps and web pages I'll mention and hopefully use this to enhance our understanding of the relationship between pollen and population health, of course. And to do this, yeah, you need a, a, a monitoring program. You need um, uh, something to get the information out to people and provide a platform to potentially ed educate people about um, what's causing their hay fever. Why are they sneezing, sneezing and wheezing and why are they suffering each day <clears throat> and having that information available in some user-friendly form is, um, is, I think, beginning to prove to be very powerful. And we did this, uh, launched a, an app and then an, uh, and a second app again in 2014 and then, which was called Canberra Pollen um, and a similar one in Melbourne and Sydney. Um, and then we've also launched here in Canberra and in Tasmania, one called Aerator as well. They're slightly different, but they're essentially on your phone information that tells you what today's pollen is, um, 
and what the forecast is for the next few days, but also um, gives the user an opportunity to enter in how they're feeling, whether they're feeling no symptoms or whether they're feeling very severe symptoms on a scale of one to five. Um, and that information has been used to help understand uh, where people are feeling bad and, and <clears throat> how prevalent is it is uh, across the region. And we've had quite good uptake of this um, phone app approach, uh, and that's enriched by information on um, the websites and, and so on. And so they're meant to be information educational tools as well as providing daily, uh, daily updates. And this is an example of some of the information we're getting back from, from people on the Canberra Pollen um, app. So this is responses to the app survey, which is just a simple question. How is your hay fever today? So is it, is it mild or is it no symptoms and all through to very severe symptoms? And you can see those colours at the ba base here. Blue, no symptoms, through to red, very severe system, symptoms. So these dots on the map, this is Canberra. Um, on a mild day on the left there, that's when the grass pollen count is very low. And you can see people all across the city and where they put in that information is actually where the dot turns up. Um, so this is geographically uh, located data that shows right across the city, most people are experiencing no symptoms or relatively mild symptoms. But if you look at a severe day when there's a lot of grass pollen in the atmosphere. Um, you can see the colours change quite dramatically. You can see a lot of people are suffering quite severe uh, uh, system, um, symptoms. And this is a last little snapshot of just how people are responding, I guess, um, and that they are actually uh, correlating in some way with the daily grass pollen counts that we're focusing on. And this is both from Canberra and Melbourne, where we run these two systems. And you can see there's a strong correlation, I guess, between low grass pollen and no symptoms versus high, high grass pollen and high symptoms. We also, through the Aerator app, the slightly different app, same information essentially, but this gives people an opportunity to write in responses and, and quite slightly different survey data. And here we've got a number of people to actually engage and answer questions about how the app and that information helped them in their daily life. And we did this three months into people using it, but also almost a year after that as well, or eight to 10 months after after that. So we did a two, two time surveys and the kind of responses we were getting, you know, even um, early on was, you know, I've been telling my friends they should join, it's changed my life and how I carry on uh, with day-to-day -day tasks. Um, it's a fantastic app, love using it. Um, improvement in ap asthma symptoms since check and checking pollen levels and avoiding high pollen days outdoors. So you can see this, we're getting responses that team, seem to suggest that people are changing their behavior a little bit because they have this information and because they're beginning to understand what's causing their asthma or hay fever responses. This is a graphic exam, uh, representation of that. So the blue is the survey one to, three, one to three months of use of the app versus 10 to eight months of use of the app. And you can see people's behavior potentially are changing um, quite significantly. So certainly people are more aware of the environment, which is I think is a key educational outcome for people using an app or visiting a website on about you know, pollen in the air. Um, people are more attentive to medications, and if that's an outcome, that's a good thing. They're potentially taking medications, you know, antihistamine, that kind of thing, um, to reduce their hay fever. Um, and that's increased with more use of the app. Uh, changed behavior, uh, you know, potentially that's, you know, something that's, that's there. Uh, some people had no change, of course. There was, um, uh, less people perhaps in the second survey. Um, and what was quite interesting was this discussed results with my health professionals. So people actually went to their doctors and said, told them about what they'd found from the, 
from the app and, and began to have a conversation with their GP, um, which I think is just having that conversation is a good shift in, in behaviour and people can come up with a good asthma plan or hay fever plan for the season ahead. And so, yeah, uh, many believe that there was an improvement in their health as a result of this. So very positive outcomes, I think, and quite a, a kind of signal that um, you know, developing these kind of apps can actually produce very positive results in, in the community. So what's the future hold? I guess um, at the moment we, as you can see from the Burkhardt Pollen Monitor, it's a daily pollen count we do each day. Um, you know, it takes somebody to actually change the, the slide in that instrument and take it back to the lab, do the count and upload, upload the pollen count into our online, online formats. Um, an improvement to that would be a more live count um, where perhaps every hour, or in the case I'm showing you now, every every second, in fact, um, you can actually um, count the pollen in the atmosphere and provide an updated um, information uh, to the end user. And so uh, certain companies around the world, one here, Swissons, we've been testing a pollen monitor, which you can see here, the silver box here, is a system they've set up, um, which takes in air and passes it past a number of uh, sensors, light, different light sensors, uh, which enables, they believe, the discrimination of uh, different pollen types. And that information then goes back wireless back to um, uh, the platform where it can be distributed to the end user. So a, a sort of live count is uh, automated real-time pollen count is the end game. And certainly there's a lot of work being done. Um, and we tested this for a year here in Canberra um, and got very positive results, but some of the pollen types were more bit difficult for the instrument to distinguish than others. So there's still a little bit of work to be done, but we're very confident, I think in the next two to five years that this um, will become probably the norm in terms of uh, pollen counting and automated real-time pollen count data being distributed to the end user in a much more rapid fashion than we do currently, which is daily um, or once a day. So in conclusion, the sort of airborne uh, pollen certainly is a really significant phenomenon in Australia and you know the the history of Australia particularly you know colonial history has brought about a lot of um, you know introduced plants and so on into the into the region and it really is this I guess a phenomenon of the Anthropocene if you'd like to put it that way um, uh, but a very interesting kind of historical aspect to it um, but surveys are beginning to show this increase now in the last decade or so of allergic rhinitis across Australia, and that no doubt comes along with an economic burden as well as a health, public health burden, um, and highlights this need for pollen monitoring to, to be done and to be done to provide a baseline um, information, even though it's a moving baseline, a, a baseline information for uh, how the, this will impact on our health you know, and how climate change will impact on things like pollen forecasting as well. Um, and the increased public health challenge, I mean, there's, it, it is really significant, I think, and um, adopting these citizen science initiatives, so I think are proving to be quite interesting and potentially impactful, I think, for uh, different communities where these app apps have been deployed. And, um, and yeah, will certainly continue to play a role, I think, in places like Canberra. And the other things we can kind of do, of course, is also begin to influence the planning, urban landscape planning policy so that we can begin to uh, perhaps reduce the amount of plantings that go on of highly allergenic trees in, in the landscapes. And we're doing this um, quite a lot in our university, of course, with, a, I guess, the university here um, in Canberra that's working quite heavily in this. And this is some of the, the very nice um, ways which our students are sort of helping to educate through uh, through into the public. You can see some of these 3D models of pollen sitting behind me here. Oops, I can show this. <laughs> these are the kind of things we're uh, producing. This is actually a grass pollen magnified 4,000 times and, and printed out on a 3D printer. 
and it can be a very useful educational tool um, to help people understand what it is that um, they're breathing into their nose um, over time. Uh, so yeah, I'd just like to say thank you very much and I hope the information I've just shared is of some interest and um, of use and I'd certainly be happy to discuss further and um, share the information with you. Um, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Zaman. It's a wonderful talk and uh, you know, enlightened with uh, uh, many of the things uh, related to the poll and which I am also not aware of. You know, uh, several things which you mentioned. I think it was a very interesting and uh, excellent talk. Thank uh, you. So before we uh, take questions for discussion, I just uh, request everybody to start their camera. We'll have one. Uh, you know. Uh, photo with uh, Professor Simon. That would be very nice. Wonderful to see you. Okay, uh, Swaroop, will you, will you be taking the picture? Yes, sir. I'm taking. Okay, thank you. Very good. Yeah, thanks, uh, Professor Simon. Uh, so, you know, there are some questions on the chat box. Before that, uh, I just like to uh, understand uh, the Poland's, uh, you know, allergies uh, related work, uh, particularly, do you think that uh, in a cold climate or from the, you know, hot and humid climate or the climate like Australia, which is completely different. So do you think that uh, is there any some uh, relations with the climate which influences uh, in terms of uh, is risk associated with asthma? Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question. And Australia has, of course, that broad range of climates from uh, the very north, which is tropical monsoon climates, which you're very familiar with, um, and down in the south, temperate uh, and you know very uh, cold um, climates in the places like Tasmania and Melbourne and Canberra, indeed. Um, so, so it's a wide range of uh, 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 biogeography, if you like, or you know, uh, different diversities. But we've monitored pollen in places like Darwin in the far north, and people again uh, certainly suffer from hay fever and asthma in those regions as well. Perhaps they're responding to different plants. In that that case, grasses are still there, but it's also some of the palms and other uh, trees that are actually producing some of the. Um, allergic reactions as well. So it's so it's slightly different plants, but people are still uh, being impacted. Um, another interesting aspect and not directly related to pollen, but of course, fire and smoke is a major aspect of creating um, respiratory problems as well. And the interaction between pollen and smoke is one of the key interesting factors that people are looking at at the moment, because um, fire in Australia is very significant and will become even more so, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, these are the kind of interactions between different airborne particles, not just pollen, but other things that are of quite interest as well and will be different across different biogeographic regions. Yeah, thanks, uh, Simon. The, my, the other question, uh, you know, the, this pollens uh, uh, in terms of the, the farming activities, like you know, uh, particularly you know in, in countries like uh, in Asian countries, uh, so th there is a lot of uh, you know uh, farming activities. Uh, as a result, uh, do you also expect that uh, there is a there is a possibility of high pollen uh, count uh, uh, in this region? And uh, uh, and is there any way we can uh, also identify uh, a particular type of pollen will be much higher and hence. Uh, the risk for asthma can be high. Yeah, no, it's it, it is interesting. That, I mean, 
For Australia, grass pollen is definitely the key. Um, and this is the, the vast areas uh, that have been cleared and developed for cattle and sheep mainly. Um, so you've got vast grasslands that have been what they call improved <laughs> by the introduction of rye grass in particular in the southern area, but other grasses in the north as well. So introduced grasses are a major issue in Australia and, and are very prevalent. And that's what's causing the problems here mostly. But interesting in you know in places like Japan, you know, rice and so on is very common, but the major pollen there that people suffer from is cypress pine. Yeah, you know, cypress, which is a tree. Um, and I showed you some pictures of the vast amounts of pollen coming out of cypress pine in that talk. So different countries have different um, major pollen. Uh, allergenic type, so it's, it varies from from country to country depending on the biogeography, and that's a very interesting thing to try and understand on not just a regional aspect, but perhaps a Asia Pacific summary or review of that would actually be quite interesting. I think I don't know that that has happened as yet, but um, would be an interesting thing to do. Thank you. And there's one question in the chat, and it uh, is a Michael. I think you maybe you, you met him also. Yeah. So he's asking some question. Uh, uh, any studies done for exploring uh, the association between daily high temperatures and uh, pollen in Canberra? Yeah, um, temperature doesn't seem to be a major driver. Uh, uh, certainly, it's uh, during our. I mean, one correlation, I guess, is when we have very or quite high temperatures. The wind can be. Um, yeah, Build up, and particularly in the afternoons, and that can be cause a lot of entrainment of um, pollen into the air. But overall, there's not a strong correlation. And I think it's, but I think it is these windy days, in particular, dry windy days from the northwest, which is the northwest of Canberra, is where most of the grasslands are situated, um, and the pasture lands. Uh, in the south, we have more eucalyptus woodland, forest, national park. Um, so it's these northerly winds, dry northerly winds that come and bring, um, and that's usually on warmer days, will bring um, lots of grass pollen across the city. And they're, they're the days that, so we, we can, can actually use that climate information to predict higher grass pollen days. And when we know there's strong northwesterly winds and it's dry, we then predict in our forecasts um, that there'll be higher grass pollen. It's harder to predict some of the trees. We don't have the tree uh, information so much uh, uh, at the moment, but uh, that's what we're working on for sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's another question. Uh, so, what are the uh, standard methods of uh, pollen measurement? You mentioned there's a yeah. couple of instruments uh, that can be useful for pollen right. measurement. And uh, if if uh, a resist wants to start, uh, so do you have some any suggestion for them? Yeah, it can be done in many ways, but the, I mean, the standard published methods tend to be use, using this Burkhart system, which comes out of England at the moment, um, and yeah, it can be bought. Uh, but uh, but yeah, that's a very it's a very robust system, and we've had ours for well over uh, ten or fifteen years. So so they they're very robust system. It's a vacuum pump, and as I showed in that pit picture, uh, so it, it's it can if you get one, they last a long time, um, and can be quite quite uh, a, a standard way. And most published papers have that as a, a way of uh, publishing. But there are other methods. There's the small Hurst monitors, which are sticky rods that spin around in the air, which you have to um, clean off and count every day as well, or whatever time frequency you want. There's, there are a range of ways of doing it, um, but yeah, you need to pick one of those standard published ways if you want to get your data published, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Yeah, so it's important to pick a methodology that's um, well known. Okay, so and this, uh, uh, there are other hair pollutants, uh, uh, you know, uh, that are Existing in the ambient, uh, for example, particulates and also the carbon monoxide, CO2, uh, yeah, oxides of nitrogen, sulfur dioxide. That's so right. You, you that, is there any correlation existing between pollen and uh, 
you know the increase in particulates concentration or maybe oxides yeah. of any other gases yeah not not so much it's not a we canberra has three stations that monitor all those aspects um daily or hourly i think that, that is put out on freely on the web pages um uh the canberra environment department do that um but looking at it closely there's there isn't a strong correlation and obviously you know bushfires those kind of events yeah, you see your PM 2.5 and 10 increasing and so on, but uh, the the, cam the pollen data don't strongly correlate with these variables. Um, it's very much more related to, you know, in particular the wind and um, you know, the, the microclimate of, of the particular day, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, but okay, interesting. Thanks, Thank you, sir. I have one more question, uh, Simon. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know that, uh, you know, uh, is it possible for us to do some quantification based on, like, you know, the the, the area of the grass uh, uh, and uh, its uh, uh, life, uh, uh, I mean, uh, its uh, uh, timeline? And yeah. then is it possible for us to quantify how much pollen will be get uh, emitted from individual plant or a tree right. and probably with using this, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, wind data, can we, can it possible for us to do some kind of a prediction? Yeah, I think there is very strong capability of doing that. And we do it to a certain extent now with reasonably um, good results. Um, I think there's other information that could be brought to bear, particularly on the slightly longer term predictions um, and the vegetation productivity indices that you can gather from satellite data is one particular interesting way of doing that. We've been able to show that use, looking at the um, uh, vegetation indice, index, uh, productivity index from, from satellite data when, when, you know, showing when the landscape is greening up as it were, um, has a strong correlation with grass pollen production as well. So, um, and in fact, it slightly leads. So when uh, vegetation indices increase, then it's only a few days after the pollen begins to increase. So that's, we've been published a couple of papers on that as a kind of, an, again, a kind of potential for using even satellite data to begin to predict when, you know, grass pollen becomes um, a significant in, in the in the region, so there's exciting possibilities. I think um, there's a few more questions in the chat. Yeah, there. yeah. yeah this a, yeah. Can, you can read it, or uh, should I? Yeah, yeah. yeah this um, is a question from Saul, uh, Surup, uh, Yeah. What is the uh, air quality standard for uh, Poland in Canberra? Uh, is it so, yeah. standards in Poland standard for Canberra in the Canberra? Yeah. Well, we take a um, we use a kind of international standard, I guess. Um, the, the permissible limit doesn't really apply. Uh, you know, it, whatever happens, happens, and um, but and people hopefully get to learn about it from our um, from our understanding. And those extreme values are are quite extreme. So um, we do do a lot of media coverage and information when those days are coming on, and people get to know that that's what's happening. Um, but permissible limit is, doesn't really apply here. It's um, <laughs> Uh, but we try to influence, obviously, government decisions about, you know, what to plant and how to minimise some of these um, high levels. Uh, so it's an interesting question. Um, but there's a question just before that about how is the correlation between CO2 and pollen release? It's, uh, that's, again, an interesting and new research uh, kind of an avenue. There's been uh, examples and experiments done, particularly in the in the states that have been published, showing in in chambers, um, showing uh, increased CO two brings about um, not just an increase in pollen abundance in many plants, particularly grasses, um, but also an increase in the intensity of um, or concentration of the allergy protein that is associated with grass pollen. So it's not just the amount of pollen, but the um, intensity or concentration of the protein as well increases with increased CO2. So if you take that to the logical extent that it's happening within a glass chamber experiment, 
um, potentially that's going to happen out in the in the uh, in the region as well. So um, again, another sort of salutary warning that changing climates will have an impact on the nature of uh, allergies as we move forward as well. And there's a final question there, I think. Um, do composite particles have fallen? And perhaps traffic source particles exist? Um, and have these been quantified in any significant amounts? Um, yeah, no, uh, that sort of comparison, I don't think we really have done so far. So it's again an interesting question that we could pursue. Um, this this idea that you know we've, we've very much been concentrating on understanding the pollen spectra and the kind of changes in different pollen types, how they interact with things like you know uh, the traffic, you know um, lead particles or uh, fire uh, you know, burning particles, CO, you know, and and so on is is less well developed. So it's, I think it's an avenue I think we'll be able to explore further as our data becomes. You know, more abundant. You know, we've been just doing it for ten years, so I think there's becoming now a real opportunity to explore these very interesting questions that people are raising here. So thanks so much for doing that. Thank you, uh, Professor Simon, and uh, uh, we look forward uh, to uh, you know uh, the joint work uh, which we are discussed. Yeah. Uh, yeah so maybe we'll uh, we'll take it forward. And uh, one uh, thing I was just uh, thinking about. Uh, uh, if the app can be used as a collaborative, so maybe we can try to bring out uh, our Indian languages and uh, see that uh, certain things can be added here, so, and, and then we can also make use of it. And uh, I'm going to, you know, uh, as I told you, we, uh, we are in the process of procuring, uh, you know, pollen measuring instruments, and we are going to start some uh, work in 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 Chennai, and probably we'll 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 have some. You know, yeah. comparative study and understand much more than that. That would be yeah, wonderful. I think that's a very important thing to do. I'd be very happy to help out or collaborate in whatever way. Th thanks, Simon. Thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, joining this uh, interesting talk. Uh, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, uh, please continue to uh, join our air quality management lecture series in the coming months. Uh, very interesting. Uh, Great initiative. Thank you, uh, Professor Simon, and. Uh, we look forward to see you uh, whether if it is a possibility. I'm also going to send an invitation to you for the sure. uh, invited talk for our uh, air quality manage, uh, uh, international conference on uh, air quality management. Thank so you. I'll, I'll look forward to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye. Yeah. Thank you all for joining the talk. Thank you. Bye bye.